was proud. I walked in here about an hour ago and all the seats were empty. And I always worry that we're going to put one of these things on and nobody's going to come. Uh, and so thank you all for coming. I'm really excited about tonight's program. Um, Douglas Hicks, Provost of Colgate University, is going to talk to us about economic inequality. His specialization is religious studies and ethics. And he also trained with um, one of the most renowned economists in the country at Harvard University. And so we're going to get a really interesting combination of religion, ethics, and economics tonight. And I'm glad to put these all together. Um, my name is Jared Orsi. I am one of the board members of the Theologian in Residence program, the sponsoring organization of tonight's event. And I would like to begin with a few, um, first of all, a welcome. And I would also like to say some thank yous. First of all, and biggest to First United Methodist Church, which is our host, which is hosting this venue this evening. And they are a great partner of the Theologian in Residence program. So um, to, uh, to David um, and Rebecca and the other representatives from First United Methodist, um, and to Pastor Steve Easterday McPadden, um, and to the First United Methodist community, we are very grateful. So thank you all for um, <laughs> And I know many of you are friends and fans of Jim Reed, a beloved member of our community, and I wanted to give you a brief update. He had surgery yesterday, and it was successful, um, as far as they can tell so far. Um, he had a, um, an injury to one of the discs in the upper part of uh, his spine, and um, for a long time we weren't sure what exactly it was. And when they went in today, they found out that there was actually a break in one of those discs and that surgery was exactly the right thing to do. Um, uh, somebody called him this afternoon and he answered the phone himself and sent a chipper. So there's um, good news so far uh, on that front. And he says thank you to this community and he appreciates uh, your, your, your prayers and, and your thoughts. Um, and so I want to pass that uh, on to you from, uh, from him and from Mary Alice. We also have the shout out. Yep. To the family, the Beard family, both the pediatrician who took care of all their kids uh -huh. and the pediatrician's kid who just took care of him. These things are sort of go generational. That's great. Thanks, Cindy. I would also like to draw your attention to some of our upcoming events. Um, first of all, one of our other partner churches, Trinity Lutheran. Um, is hosting this uh, symposium called The Essence of Peace. And we've got a really wonderful lineup of, of speakers and topics and conversations here. So um, I'd encourage you to pick up their brochure um, on your way out the door. We have a bunch of these um, uh, flyers. We also, as always, would love to have your feedback. And I know I talked to half a dozen or maybe even seven or eight people who are here at a Theologian in Residence program tonight for the first time. Um, and so, uh, for whether you're a veteran or a first timer, we love feedback um, from you. We go over these at our board meetings and talk about where the implications of what we, we hear. So, if, if you would like to fill out a feedback form for us, these are also on the welcome table on your way out. Um, I kind of feel like I'm in one of my classes right now making announcements. But, um, uh, tonight's event is the second in a nine month series that explores economic inequality. And our goal in putting this together was partly to put on the table really important um, uh, topic and to put it on the table in a context of faith. And this community right here, we have a, a diverse collection of people who come um, uh, to the topic of inequality and to our events from lots of different uh, viewpoints and directions. And one of our goals was um, to, to look at this, from, this problem from a variety of different angles. And so we led off with our last event about a month ago with Kate Ward of Boston College, uh, who is a Catholic theologian, and we asked her to look at the papal exhortation that came out about a year ago that drew worldwide attention, worldwide Christian attention, 
to this question of economic inequality and ask Christians to think about what, how this, what this meant in terms of their faith. And, um, and so she talked about that document. And today we're going to attack it from a slightly um, different perspective. Um, we're going to talk about it in terms of, uh, of, of ethics and morals. We're going to talk about it from uh, the perspective of a Presbyterian. Um, we're going to talk about it from the perspective of the university. And um, so this is an attempt to get at it from a slightly different sort of perspective. We have some other events coming up. We're going to bring in an economist in in the spring. We'll talk about economic inequality from an economics standpoint. We're going to bring in some people who are working on immigration and thinking about what does inequality mean in a globalizing um, world in which lots of people are moving um, across national uh, boundaries. The other important thing that we want to make sure it gets on the table is a very local view of this. We can talk about um, inequality at a national level, we can talk about it at a global level, but it also affects people at a local level. So we have a number of local speakers who are going to be um, uh, uh, talking about economic inequality here in Northern Colorado and Fort Collins. And our next event will come up on November 10th, um, in just a couple of weeks, and I'm very um, excited to have Jim and Maria Cox, who will talk about their work in the community. Um, and so we'll, we'll look at it not as an abstract um, bird's eye sort of view, but as something that's affecting us and our neighbors and our friends. And Jim and Maria are here tonight um, and in the audience, and I'm very looking, much looking forward to your talk coming up as well. Um, so there's a lot going on here at TIR. I hope if you enjoy tonight's event, you will join us for additional ones. I would like at this point to turn the um, microphone over to David Reed, um, another member of the um, TIR board who will introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you, Jared. Uh, before I do that, I just want to say we get thanked at First United Methodist often and heartily by the TIR crowd, and I appreciate that, but we want to thank TIR for being here. This adds enormously to our program. Give yourselves that hand. So I am very pleased to introduce our guest speaker tonight, Dr. Douglas Hicks. Uh, you've probably seen some of the publicity about his current work at Colgate. Um, he holds, I hope I'm allowed to say this, a wealth of titles at Colgate. Um, he is provost, he is dean of faculty, he is professor of religion. Uh, as you'd expect, being provost puts him in charge of all the academic programs, but he does more than that. Uh, he oversees the university libraries, information technology, athletics, museums, and the Office of Equity and Diversity. Uh, Dr. Hicks received his uh, AB with honors in economics from Davidson College, uh, an MDiv uh, from Duke University, the same as our own Reverend Rebecca McPhee, uh, and in fact they were classmates uh, at, at Duke. Um, and uh, he received his uh, MA and PhD degrees from Harvard, where he studied with uh, theologian Ronald Thiemann and Nobel Prize winning economist Amartya Sen. Uh, he's an ordained clergyman in the Presbyterian Church USA. He's married to Catherine Bagwell, a professor of psychology at Colgate, and they have two children, Noah and Ada. And as uh, Doug informed us, he's taking a very early plane tomorrow so that he can be home for that most Christian of holidays, Halloween. <laughs> And Noah and Ada are looking forward to having him there. Uh, Dr. Hicks has written extensively on the topic uh, before us tonight, beginning with his first book entitled Inequality and Christian Ethics. Uh, but there are a couple of other things that I want you to know about Doug before we bring him up here. Last summer, he led a group at Colgate of faculty on a pilgrimage along the Camino de Santiago in Spain. This is quite a thing for faculty to take up. They walked for 11 days and they covered 140 miles. Um, while some of these people complained about this being just grueling and not spiritual enough, he reminded them that understanding how life can be grueling was an aspect of spirituality that these university professors might want to get in touch with. <laughs> now, and finally, on a more personal note, uh, you should know that I met Doug uh, long before he came into Fort Collins last night. Twice I interviewed him for the publication Vital Theology. Um, once he talked about growing economic inequality several years ago, and he made some pretty sharp comparisons between contemporary America and the Gilded Age. 
Um, but Vital Theology is positioned, was positioned as a really serious, serious publication. And so um, I asked Doug if he would do a theological analysis, analysis of Donald Trump's TV show, The Apprentice. <laughs> Now, Doug was running a leadership institute at the University of Richmond at that time, so he knew a little bit about running businesses, um, and he wasn't too kind in assessing the Donald. Trump showed no respect for his employees. He tried to motivate them with fear. He positioned them for failure by pitting one against another. Well, it was a miserable showing by Donald Trump and a brilliant analysis by Doug, but best of all, it resulted in our best headline ever. Hicks to Trump. You're fired. <laughs> now please welcome Doug to the podium. Does this Jared would like to just say a word of blessing over him? The way we do this is we just ask everybody to um, silently offer their own blessing upon you, um, that you may speak uh, wisdom, and that we all may have open ears, and whatever blessings you would like to wish individually um, on our speaker this evening. So if you could just raise your hands, and we'll have just a moment of silent blessing for our speaker. that he's gotten me into real jams before. <laughs> so I'll try to say some provocative things so that he can get some headlines out of this. I also hope that Jared didn't take all my notes with him. Well, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. It's really an honor and privilege to talk about this important topic. Um, I believe Colgate University is still doing well and flourishing, even though I'm in Denver. Uh, it's good to get away from central New York sometimes and, and to talk about my own work and to share ideas. And um, this seems like such a wonderful forum, the Theologian in Residence program, and I'm happy to be here to be part of this important series as well. I want to thank uh, Jared Horsey for, uh, for inviting me and for the nice conversation we had at breakfast and um, what a privilege it was to meet um, Joe Kim Yes, today, and to hear his vision for this program, and to share ideas, and to hear his own story, uh, and his own evolution in his thinking, and important work that he's done. And Denise Meyer, thank you for the brownies, um, <laughs> and the great organization that you do, and um, thanks for welcoming me. And David, it is a pleasure to see you again, and to pick up the conversation again that we've been having for a decade now. So I'll jump right in, so I won't filibuster the rest of our time. Um, so, in, how inequality is a moral issue is our topic. I think it will come up on the screen. We're good, right? There it is. We're good. Uh, economic inequality is one of the most urgent issues of our time. It's also one of the most complicated issues. And in my own opinion, if it weren't so complicated and difficult to talk about, it would be the leading issue of our time. It's so important and the trends are quite disturbing in terms of particularly inequality in the United States but also some of the international phenomena. Inequality is an interesting topic because it's defined by what it is not. Now, equality is the moral term I want to uh, talk about a good bit tonight. But And equality is a pretty crisp, clear, precise topic, we can easily talk about equal pay or equal shares of a pie or equal snowfall between Fort Collins and Denver or equal bags of candy for trick-or-treat that my kids are already fighting over. But inequality is a fuzzy concept. 50-50 is an even distribution split between two people. But 51-49 is unequal, but not as unequal as 85-10. And so one of the things we've got to talk about is how you measure inequality, how much is too much, and so forth. And in fact, I want to uh, do a little bit of review of some inequality figures and trends, and then move to the moral discussion. 
The more challenging question, though, for me that I want to pose before you is the inequality of what? Or why does inequality matter? Which kind of inequality are we going to talk about? And basically, when you get right down to it, I want to close with this question. How much economic inequality is acceptable in order to say that we have established the economic or social conditions that, that guarantee or respect our moral equality? So many of you have seen Robert Reich's documentary as part of this series. How many? Just so I have an idea. You've seen it, and that's good. Uh, and he really focuses on three questions. First, uh, what is happening with income inequality? Second, why is it happening? And third, so what? What do we make of it? And why does it matter? I'm going to spend just a couple moments on the first two questions, kind of the opposite of what he does, um, and then go to the third question, so what? Why does it matter? How does it matter socially, civically, and morally? And as good as his documentary is, he kind of left that question at the end. He implied it's a threat to democracy, it's a threat to social solidarity, but I want to unpack that and think with you tonight. So, first, what is going on? How has economic inequality increased? I should say right now, I am not an economist. I don't play one on TV, and I'm not playing one tonight. But I was fortunate to, enough to be trained uh, at Harvard by Amartya Sen, who's a great philosopher of economics and a, a, a scholar of economic development. And so I don't, I, there will be others who can go over this data better than I can, but I want to present it because it's important background for our conversation. So first, let's look at income distribution over time in the post-war period. Reich talks about this as the bridge effect. Um, and you start at World War II and you look until the late 60s and you see a general decline. This is the Gini coefficient. A general decline from 1945 down to, to the late 60s. And then in the early 70s you see a, a reversal of that. And I've got both family and household income. Family income goes back further than the data in the Census Bureau for the household. But most economists say households are a better measure, which picks up at the red line. It trends the same way. And you see that inequality has continued to increase uh, across time since the 70s until now. In fact, it goes across administrations, and it continues to be uh, so important that people like Warren Buffett and Janet Yellen and Pope Francis have talked about this as one of the leading moral issues of our time. So another way of looking at the first was the Gini coefficient, which is a measure of distance from an equality line in which everyone has the same number of shares of um, the economic, the income distribution. Another way of talking about this is just to look at the shares of the top 20%, the bottom 20%, percent i have also included the top 5%. And you'll see that the uh, top 20% has increased significantly over this period of the last four decades, whereas the, um, the rate the share to the lowest quintile, lowest 20%, has gone from about 6% of the uh, of the income distribution, total income, to about 4%. And you can see that the top 5% has increased along with the top 20. And if we went to look at the top 1% or the super rich, the top 0.1%, you'd see an even more staggering graph upwards. And then another way of looking at this, and these are all ways of getting at the same data. This is looking at the person at the 90th percentile of the income distribution divided by the person at the 10 percent, 10th percentile of the distribution. And you see a significant and important shift towards the persons at the top as compared to the persons at the bottom. But then you ask the question, what does this mean for uh, poverty, those who are at the bottom? And after a period of the, of the early 1960s, when uh, Medicaid in particular helped reduce the poverty rate of the elderly, the poverty rate itself has remained in the range of 15%, dropping down towards 12%. It's cyclical. And it's really not that helpful of a, of a, of a measure, especially when we're trying to look at the distributional effects of the income distribution as a whole. There is a debate with a supplemental poverty measure in blue to the left to the, at recent times that suggests that the poverty line 
it, and the poverty measure is not an accurate way to look at poverty. It looks at three times a food basket, it was an emergency food basket um, developed in the late 50s, um, and that there are other new expenses for people like childcare, like transportation, um, like housing, like technology that aren't included in this food basket uh, times three. And so we're looking at supplemental measures. But why haven't we shifted to a better measure of poverty? Well, because no president has wanted, with a, uh, with a switch, to have poverty increase by two or three percent. So we stick with the old measure. But you see that it is important. I want to talk a little later about the moral just difference between looking at poverty, which is a focus on the bottom, it's a focus on deprivation, and inequality, which is really a relational measure of uh, the distribution as a whole. And I've argued, or I suggest tonight that, you know, and you're here, so you might believe this already, that inequality as opposed to poverty is something important to talk about. Not that poverty itself isn't, but that inequality allows us to talk about relationality, community, solidarity, if you will, across the distribution. So, another aspect of looking at this moral question of inequality and why it matters is to look at the global situation. And one of the leading researchers in economic inequality globally is at the, has been at the World Bank for a long time, Branko Milanovic. And when we look at the second question that Reich asked, which is why is inequality increasing? There are a number of factors, but the one word that's often mentioned is globalization. Well, if you think inequality is a hard term to define, globalization is even harder because it accounts for a number of things, technological changes, communications improvements, the lowering of trade barriers, um, the increase of uh, production that's split across the, uh, across the world, and so forth. And what Milanovic helps us to see is that globalization's effects have not been shared equally across the income distribution. And so the winners of economic globalization have been China's middle class and consumers. And we're all consumer, we're all part of the labor market, or part of those who supply to the economy and then those who benefit from products and services. And so we as consumers have found cheaper and cheaper goods. We were talking at dinner about the way that the cost of a calculator has dropped precipitously in the last three decades. So, but then there have been those who have lost in the globalization um, developments over the last decades. And if you look at the US lower middle class, they're, they're actually in the 70th to 80th percentile, that part of the world income distribution. And so there have been winners and losers, and those in the American middle class, particularly those associated with manufacturing, have been those who have lost, and their economic growth over the years has been much slower than other parts. And then for those at the very top of the global distribution, they're doing pretty well. So this is a helpful distinction and a helpful clarification of the global situation. I hope it raises some questions we can talk about later. And then finally, to look at the global, uh, to compare measures of inequalities across societies. One thing I'd like to, to think with you about is when we look at the world uh, economy as a whole or global society as a whole, just, I'll note it here and talk about it later, the income distribution of the world as a whole, if we truly imagine ourselves as a global citizenry, as a global economy, it's a greater level of inequality than any society in the world. So we think about Brazil and South Africa and Guatemala as having some of the highest income distributions in the world, the most disparity between rich and poor. If you imagine us as global citizens, we have a higher level than any of those societies. There's a lot of interesting moral discussion to have there. But the U.S. is at the top end of uh, developed economies or industrialized economies in terms of our level of economy uh, of inequality. And the Scandinavian countries, Sweden is here, um, are at the low end. And so for all of the countries that um, consider themselves high development, we're at the high end. Many of you know this already, but I thought it was worth reviewing. So at what level do we talk about social fragmentation? or social inequalities that lead people to go to the streets. This is uh, Zuccotti Park. Um, I happened to see protesters in London and in Glasgow, and I took my students to Madrid, and we met with Los Indignados, those indignant, or those who were rejecting this, uh, the, the 
global economy, the situation that those of the 99% of the US parliaments were facing. And the question is, at what level does social fragmentation truly divide us and lead to consequences that um, are truly confrontational, not in some theoretical sense, but in some physical sense? So this is one of the ways of looking at um, inequality and where it might take us. I want to unpack it and get beyond this. Two great epidemiologists led by Richard Wilkinson and then Kate Pickett have shown the social effects of inequality. And they've shown, uh, they've got a number of great books um, that are worth looking at. The Spirit Level is really one of the best books I know on inequality. And they show that while uh, average income for societies doesn't predict a lot about health outcomes or social outcomes, inequality measures show us a lot. And so this measure, uh, th this graph um, includes on the y-axis an index of health and social problems. This is a reading test also. Um, <laughs> life expectancy, literacy, infant mortality, homicides, teenage births, and so forth. Yeah, I don't, th we can leave that off. Um, the graphs are prettier than the, uh, the uh, presenter. Um, on the y-axis in the x-axis maps it countries by the level of inequality income inequality with, uh, on your right, the U.S. being at the high end. But you see that the um, lower the level of economic inequality, the better are the social indicators and health indicators for that society. And so life expectancy, for instance, for the United States, we're about 40th in the world in terms of life expectancy, behind Cuba, for instance, behind other societies that have um, far lower um, income productivity but that um, don't, but have far less, obviously, income inequality. So converting income to other factors of well-being is something important, something I want to say about. So I want to spend the rest of the time this evening talking, trying to map out inequality as a moral issue. There are lots of ways to look at this issue, and I want to present a number of questions and things that we can talk about, and I promise to leave time for discussion. Um, and I hope you'll leave tonight with, some, with a set of questions or a set of lenses to think about the, the debates about inequality, which I would say are heavy on rhetoric, heavy on graphs, and light on real moral analysis of what it means to have social fragmentation or what the implications of increased inequality really are. Um, so I want to lay out a set of tensions or a set of um, poles, polarities that we can think about. One of them is the question of, do we care about this because of self-interest, or do we care about it because of morality? And this is one of those issues where self-interest and morality tend to track with each other. I'm always skeptical of saying, this is the right thing to do. It's also in my interest to do, because that's not always true. And we need to be able to make the hard choices even when it's not in our self-interest. But this is one of those issues when you have Warren Buffett, and more recently the head of the Federal Reserve Bank, talking about this and the uh, recent uh, survey of millionaires that was done. Half of the millionaires say we need a higher marginal tax rate. When you have people talking about that, you see self-interest tracking with morality. So what are some of the self-interest arguments for, and then I'm going to move to the discussions more directly. Lower inequality leads to higher growth. There are good data to, to show this, and now we have leading analysts of the economy and of the politics talking about this. Um, when we have persons at the bottom end of the economic distribution or the socioeconomic distribution not being well educated, not being able to fill jobs, not being prepared to be citizens, not engaging in the political order, that's not good for anyone. When we have Persons who are well prepared and who can contribute to society, there are lower costs for medical care, for social services, for even incarceration. And so this is in the self-interest of those across the income distribution. We are going to move towards the moral, towards the, uh, moral dimension when we show, and Wilkinson and Pickett have shown carefully by cross-state and cross-country comparisons, that the higher the level of inequality in a society, the lower level of social trust that exists. So in other words, the lower the economic inequality, the higher the social capital 
to use Robert Putnam's term, or the level of social trust that we have with each other. And finally, uh, talking about solidarity and fellow feel feeling, uh, Pickett and Wilkinson show that higher levels of inequality in societies also lead to higher levels of anxiety, not just um, among the poor, but also among the rich. And the opposite of that, in a much more positive, constructive way of talking about those things, is to talk about social solidarity, or Adam Smith's famous phrase, <coughs> fellow feeling. So then when we move to moral frameworks, I'm going to talk about three frameworks tonight. Uh, I'll talk briefly about the philosophical framework, uh, John Rawls' theory of justice. I know there's at least a couple of philosophers in the audience, so I hope you're pleased about that. And then uh, to move to two theological examples that um, connect to the different, in some ways, I think the audience tonight, one of the leading Protestant theologians of our, our time, of the 20th century anyway, H. Richard Niebuhr, and then one of the Catholic uh, leading voices of the uh, late 20th century and into the 21st, Gustavo Gutierrez, who draws on the Catholic social tradition from Rerum and Navarum forward, but also is um, inter an internal critic of that tradition as well, so I call it Catholic liberationist thought. And one of the interesting questions uh, Jared and I spoke about this morning over breakfast, in fact, is how we put those moral frameworks and theological frameworks in conversation. I think it's important to say, you know, you were in a college town, we have plenty of people who call themselves spiritual but not religious. We have people who call themselves secular, people who call themselves post-Christian, evangelical, Christian, not to mention Jewish and Hindu and Muslim and so forth. And I hope I'm not talking out of school, but someone asked if this would, this would be an interesting talk tonight, but would it be too religious? Um, so I, I don't know, I'll leave that to, for you to be the judge of. But I'm presenting three different moral frameworks because I have faith that we can actually share across the, the tradition. And these three aren't radically that far apart. I'd say they all move out of a general spirit of Christendom that the Rawlsian view, Rawls himself was Episcopalian, but come out of a general Western ethos that's deeply influenced by the Christian commitment to, inequal to, to equality. Um, but let's just to note that this pluralistic discussion, how we talk to each other, do we, in Rawls's term, reach an overlapping consensus with our moral arguments, or do we not, is a really important one. So Rawls's approach uh, to justice, uh, famous, uh, probably the most significant uh, political theory of justice in the 20th century, um, was based on two principles. First was the liberty principle, or that um, in, a, in a society that would be set up by the person behind the veil of ignorance, not knowing their own social location, they would agree upon these principles of justice. The first one would be that you would give everyone equal liberties consistent with an equal basket of liberties for everyone, the most possible liberties that we could achieve. And then once everyone had equal liberty, I don't know why you call the two principles of justice when they're really three, 2A and 2B, but we'll go with, with uh, Professor Rawls. Um, the second... Uh, principle 2A was the uh, fair equality of opportunity principle, is that positions would be open to persons according to their talent, and it would be open to all. And it, Rawls even used the term fair equality of opportunity, as if equality of opportunity wasn't enough. He said it has to be fair. Um, and it's only at that point that uh, principle 2B comes in, which is the difference principle, which says that any inequalities, and he's really talking about inequalities of wealth and income, any inequalities that exists should be to the benefit of the least well-off. How could that be? Well, he's allowing for things such as a, a rising tide lifting all boats. He's allowing for the market idea. But look at how constrained it is by these equal liberties and by fair quality of opportunity. But he says if you can get that established, then to have a market where people are really incented to be excellent um, and people who uh, really are great entrepreneurs succeeding and paying taxes back to the state would help everyone because it might strengthen our social safety net, it might open up opportunities. He assumed it would create social mobility and so forth. So it's a very high vision uh, based on Western social contract theory that inequalities might well be to the benefit of the least well off. But look at how tight the principles are that you first got to really establish those liberties and you've got to have make sure that opus offices are open to talent and not to uh, persons because of the color of their skin, or who their parents are, or how much money they have, and so forth. 
So this is a powerful tradition of inequality, and it was a pretty radical critique of the American system as we have it. And you know, Rawls had a, a very active debate about whether he was pro-market or anti-market. And he would have said, he's deceased now, um, would have said he was very much in favor of the market, but only when constrained by a healthy um, social contract reflected in a government of the people that established uh, principles one and two B. So then come back to uh, the theological world and think about one of the great theological ethicists in H. Richard Niebuhr, you know, Reine's brother, Reinhold's brother, and um, arguably the, the deeper thinker, although I really respect Reinhold Niebuhr's thought, you probably read Moral Man and Immoral Society at some point in political science or philosophy. <coughs> H. Richard Niebuhr um, talked a lot about political notions of equality and was more towards, the in the Reformed tradition, more towards um, the Calvinist side of things and uh, Reinhold moved more towards the Lutheran side of things and they had some interesting debates, including in public, including in the Christian century, about how to think about social ethics in society. Niebuhr, H. Richard Niebuhr, uh, approached the world from a theocentric position uh, that God was not only the creator of the world but the center of all value and that values are derived from the commitment uh, of God as the center and that there were other penultimate values such as an economic system or such as family or such as other social orderings or art and culture where people weren't valued equally but that the fundamental ultimate value was God and that, that the theocentric view of the world established an equality. How did being, because God is the source of all being, including of all people. So there are really three aspects of equality before God that come out of H. Richard Niebuhr. First, uh, people are all created in the image of God as equals and of equal worth, but not of our own worthiness. We're created, the one who deserves the merit is God. And so none of us is worthy of special attention or special uh, privilege. Um, ultimately, when you look at ultimate moral value, the, the uh, God's love and equal love goes universally to all people. But secondly, if we're all created by the same parent, then we're also siblings. So we get to something about relationality, that um, not only are we um, equal with each other and not deserving of special privilege, but we're connected, we're interconnected, and so this relationality becomes a key uh, bulwark or a foundation of Niebuhr's thought, which leads to his own ethic of responsibility because none of us earned our own lives, none of us um, earned the opportunity to excel in the economy, for instance. Um, we have a responsibility to look out for others through gratitude and through the responsible selfhood that we would live in the world. Now, being a good reformed theologian, um, H. Richard Niebuhr talked also about being equals in both dignity and in sin. And the second part, so it's a pretty, pretty interesting concept that all of us are subject, and he talked about this in the late 20th century, uh, or mid, mid to late 20th century, as um, total depravity of the human being. Not that we're, every part of us is so corrupt that we can't um, do good, but that every aspect of human being, including our societies, including our economies, are corrupt, and that power of particular individuals should be put into check. And so that because of the capacity that we all have to do evil, to do ill, we need to be suspicious of anyone having excessive amounts of power. And so he wrote more about the political sphere than the economic sphere, but his own ethic for me says we should be suspicious of political power or economic power, or especially when economic and political power are aligned. So that was our Presbyterian moment. <laughs> now, to go back to the to, uh, Catholic tradition, particularly the liberationist strands and the father of liberation theology in Latin America, the Peruvian theologian Gustavo Gutierrez, Whereas H. Richard Niebuhr starts with the ideal of equality, <coughs> the liberationists and Gutierrez start 
with inequality. They start with the current moment of human suffering, with the current moment of injustice, the current moment of what, what, uh, what uh, Gutierrez calls non-personhood. So, whereas uh, European theologians would have his interlocutors, um, philosophers and others who would debate the existence of God, Gutierrez said the fundamental question for liberationists was, are people human persons? Do people have personhood? So and he says some people are uh, living in squalor and poverty in, in, in Peru, for instance, are so oppressed that they don't even know that they're persons. And so that's where we start. We don't start with an ideal of you know, equality and a, create out of the image of God, but we start where we are, which is a situation of extreme deprivation um, for the poor in Latin America and beyond. And in this context, then, the liberation comes from a particular Christology that Jesus is with the poor and is among the poor and so forth. And it's probably worth spending a little time on this notion of the preferential option for the poor um, and its tension with the common good theology. And so the liberation like Ignacio Eacria, who was, you know, murdered and um, in, in, in Central American violence, and Gutierrez and others who talk about the preferential option for the poor, they also talk about a common good. Ea Correa famously said that the common good in El Salvador was neither good nor common, um, but rather it was a rhetoric imposed with those who were in power to maintain the status quo. But if you look at Gutierrez's arguments, and you particularly put it in dialogue with the, uh, with the Catholic bishops of the United States and their economic justice for all document, I want to suggest, you may want to push back, I want to suggest that the common good is actually the overarching theme and that the preferential option is about getting people to be actually be included, to be part of the common good. But there is a critique, as you know, including um, uh, John Paul II's 80, 1984 and 86 letters against the liberationists, it was that, that they were unduly influenced by the Marxists and that, um, that the preferential option was too tied to envy and it was actually going to invert society and that God wasn't preferential but that God was treating everyone equally. I think the argument here is that, um, and there are certainly biblical texts to talk about this, that um, the preference for the poor and the widow and the orphan and the alien was in order to make them included in society as equals. But there is a tension between the common good and the preferential option for the poor. And finally, an, another note I want to raise as we talk about inequality in uh, economic and social spheres is the notion in liberation theology. It's also present somewhat in Vatican II through Paul VI of integral liberation. That liberation doesn't just occur in some spirit, spiritual realm. And I want to suggest and move towards the fact that it's also not about just uh, money-based spheres of income and wealth. Integral liberation is more about human well-being across the spheres than it is about any particular sphere. So here are a couple other tensions I want to raise for you. One is the question of absolute deprivation versus relative deprivation. As I mentioned before, poverty is simply uh, a, a definition or it's a description of reality of deprivation of something. And it's about individuals, it could be about families, but it's about individuals who do not have certain things that are determined to be fundamental. And in the U.S., as in uh, the global uh, poverty measures, um, it's often reduced to an income measure. So poverty is uh, about the money it would take to get food and shelter and health care and so forth. But I'll come back to that. Inequality is a measure, a phenomenon of the distribution, <coughs> and it helps us to think about the relationship of the rich to the poor and those in the middle. And to think about, and for me it's a, I don't want to say we shouldn't talk about poverty, of course we should, but we should talk about it in relation to those who are rich and those who are in the middle. Why? Well, because this, note, this question of do we care about absolute deprivation or relative deprivation disappears when we think of the fact that we're all living in society and that well-being isn't, unless you're a Trappist monk in a beautiful monastery, and even that is a community. Um, unless you're isolated, 
how others are doing has a fundamental relationship to how you're doing, how we're all doing together. So Adam Smith famously said that in order to be a day laborer in uh, 18th century Britain, you had to have a linen shirt in order to appear in public without shame. So a linen shirt was a necessity not to keep us clothed, but to appear in public without shame, to have dignity in public. Now, I don't know how many of you are wearing linen shirts tonight, but I hope, but I would say the linen shirt in our society isn't required to appear in public without shame. Now, uh, as I've written, if you're on a college campus today and you don't have a cell phone, there's shame. There's a sense of, at least a sense of non-inclusion. It is, sure, it's a, it's a privilege to have a cell phone, but we just pull all the phones at Colgate out of the dorms because students aren't using them. So if you want to, there's one on each hall and so forth. If you want to be uh, included and easily ex have access, yeah, you can go to the library and use the computer and log in that way and get your messages over the, you know, VOIP uh, uh, connection. Or you can have your cell phone like everyone else. So it's not essential for survival, but it is essential for inclusion. And even more interesting to me, as I saw the MAX, this uh, interesting um, public transport corridor with barriers and so forth, um, public transport, or transport is an important sense of inclusion, and not only to get to jobs, but to be able to get around. So is a car an essential? Well, it is if you live in Los Angeles, or if you live in Hamilton, New York, but, in some, but it's not if you live in Manhattan. So these goods and the determination of what is relative deprivation or relative well-being has very much to do with what the social conditions are. And we can control that and help others. And if you don't have a cell phone, just to finish the thought, if you don't have a cell phone in Fort Collins, it's a lot harder now than it was a few years ago to find a pay phone. So my, my products that I have in my pocket over there uh, affect others' well-being as well. So this notion of absolute deprivation or relative deprivation, poverty being the absolute and inequality being something about relative deprivation, I think collapses really in practice. So then I want to expand our thinking about inequality in a different way, and that is to suggest that income is an important means, no doubt about it, an important means to having a, a flourishing life, to being included in society, to having access to those goods and services that we need. But uh, economist Amartya Sen, who uh, David's already mentioned, talks instead of income about capabil a capabilities approach to well-being, which expands our thinking beyond income and wealth, a money sphere, to other important goods that uh, relate to how we're doing in society. So we can talk about another set of things. I'll go to that in a second. But we, if we're expanding our focus on different goods, then we ask inequality of what? Why are we focusing on income? Why are we focusing, for instance, in this graph, uh, in this table, on um, life expectancy? Isn't that a more fundamental aspect of how well we do, how long we're going to live? Or how about health? Or how about literacy? Why aren't those the things we're focusing on? And one of the answers is, well, those things are a lot harder to measure. <laughs> so, uh, you know, to use economic parlance, um, income is a, is a proxy for utility. And utility, I'll add, is a proxy for well-being overall. And we could have a good debate between John Stuart Mill and Jeremy Bentham on what utility is. But the point is, income is a reduction. It's a simplification of how we think about well-being. And Amartya Sen and others are trying to broaden the sphere about what we're talking, the, the scope of what we're talking about. And so, in my own work, I want to suggest that the theological approaches that we've looked at, uh, the Niburian one and the uh, liberationist one, uh, when it moves towards integral li liberation, can learn a lot from the, the economists who are also expanding our thinking from income based, based measures alone. So here's a set of selective capabilities. I'll just say they're, easy, they're harder to measure than income, but I'll also suggest they're more important. So the first one is having access to and resources to buy basic goods and services. Here, 
Money matters a lot. But it's not the end all and be all. If uh, in many societies in the world today, if you're a woman and you have all the money in the world, you're going to have trouble earn, uh, owning certain kinds of property. If you're in Hamilton, New York, and you want to eat at one of the uh, Michelin four-star restaurants, you can have all the money that you want and be the president of Colgate University or the head of Chobani Yogurt, it's Hamdi Ulakai, is down the street. You can't get a four-star Michelin um, meal unless you fly your private jet down to Manhattan and back. You can do that. But the, avail the question of income is a, is a necessary but not sufficient condition to achieving some important goods. Beyond uh, basic goods and services, these are more important aspects. Being in good health, being in good uh, having good education, having friends and loved ones, being a political and cultural participant, being able to worship and express oneself religiously or morally. These are the kind of capabilities we want to talk about. For me, these are uh, steps these are aspects of life that are easier to connect to Christian theology than some theology of income inequality. But they all fit together when we're talking about human flourishing, human capability. And then another dimension, one of the last ones I want to get to, and then before we go to conversation, and that is to ask this question, when we, when we look at inequality and we say it's rising in the United States, and it's ex at extremely high levels globally, but arguably not rising, but just flattening. Which of these frames of reference are we going to take? Are we going to take the national one or a local one and really <coughs> care about those who are near us? Or are we going to take a global frame and say that in a world where uh, we, the last figure I saw, the median world income was the, so the middle person in the world income distribution earned under $2,000 a year. Are we going to focus on that reality, even to the detriment or to the more, um, putting us backward on the question of inequality in the U.S.? I don't think this is an either-or question, but I think we easily move to talk about inequality in the U.S. without thinking about some of these other issues. And some of the, the income figures, the poverty figures for, at the global level are just mind blowing. It's hard to even wrap our heads around um, how little persons earn. And the more we become a global economy and we talk about inclusion, the more the fact that persons earn under $2,000 a year matters. And so Leonardo Boff, another one of the liberationists, so someone who came to Harvard in 1994 and um, got to spend some time with him, he was silenced by the Vatican at one point because of his liberationist teachings. He shifted in his own thinking from his early writings that said um, uh, that the market was unjust in Brazil, that the market was evil in a sense, that it was sinful and that it was a structure that was hurting the economy and the well-being, the economic well-being of local persons. He shifted in the early 90s to saying that exclusion from the market in Brazil was sinfulness. And it was marginalization and leaving people out of the market that was bad. That's a pretty significant shift. And it's a realization that most people in the world are now part of a global economy. And we need to think about that. That takes moral imagination. You know, Benedict Anderson and others say that to imagine a country of over 300 million is a social construction. That is America. Um, to think, so is it really that much harder to imagine ourselves as, as global citizens? Of course it is, it's a lot harder. But it might, it requires the same thing, global imagination and solidarity across borders. But even with the, in, this, in this particular discourse, there's a lot of criticism of globalization rhetoric and that globalization is bad and so forth. But just a reminder in my final bullet point there, that when you think of the term oikos and nomos, or management of the household, which derives to what word? Right, economics. Oikos nomos comes from two Greek words, but it means management of the household. And when you think of oikos also being the word for ecumenics or ecumenism, uh, when we talk about God's world, we talk about creation, we're talking about the global scope. And you go out to universality, we really need to be thinking about a global ethic even for those who are critical of the globalization processes. 
So economists and public policy analysts would say that how do you address inequality? Well, you need a strong market system and you need strong social supports. You need a strong infrastructure, you need social services, including education, healthcare, transportation, and the like. And so it's not an either or. We live in a time when there's a lot of pro-market rhetoric out there that you either support the market or you don't. Some would call it a market fundamentalism, I'm not sure if that's quite warranted. But, um, and then there are others who are critics of the market, including many of my friends and colleagues in Christian ethics who want to have an anti-market approach or an alternative to the market. Much of the Catholic social teaching over the last uh, century and plus has talked about a third way and the third way was between socialism and the market. Now that second way of socialism has kind of fallen off as a possibility. So the question now is not are we going to have a market economy or not. That's a good way to waste an evening in debate. Um, the question is what kind of market economy will we have? And what relation will it have to uh, governmental structures and constraints? I have uh, two, two book covers here, Adam Smith's uh, Wealth of Nations and Adam Smith's Theory of Moral Sentiments. And Smith would, had said that Moral Sentiments was his more important work. And his first edition was written uh, in 1759, I believe, and Wealth of Nations was 1776. Smith said that justice is the main pillar upon which the economy, uh, upon which society stands, and the economy fit within the uh, moral framework of moral sentiments. So I'll just say a couple of things about our response. And then let's have a conversation about response. What then shall we do? Um, and I want to suggest that our responses should occur at, at at least three levels. And I, I think it's a probably an incomplete list. First, uh, at the personal level, what kinds of direct outreach do we have in Fort Collins? What kind of outreach do you have at First United Methodist Church to persons in need um, in society? How do we think about that? but also our own individual advocacy work. How do we work at the local level, national level, global level for advocacy? I saw David Beckman's book back there. He's the founder, or not the founder, but the president of Bread for the World, which does advocacy in the United States mostly for US governmental policies towards, um, towards the whole world to help people to get access to food and good nutrition around the world. Individuals contribute to Bread for the World, and it's something that individuals can do, but it goes out to the wider levels. What can you do at the community level or the local level? Well, not only do we need to talk about effective social services and programs, but also smart strategies that line up. I talked with one of your uh, reporters from the, is it the Colorado uh, today who's writing a story. Are you here today? today? Pat, it's not here. She said she might come, but she's not here. She's watching the replay of Game 7. <laughs> uh, not only do we need programs on job training and good public transportation and affordable housing and good education, but we need communities to come together and make sure that the housing policy fits with the transportation policy, fits with the job, transfer, uh, job training programs. So there was a lot of the Richmond, Virginia bus system where I was before I went to Colgate that um, wasn't that efficient and didn't have a lot of ridership. And there was one bus that went out to uh, the west end of Henrico County and that bus was called the Jobs Bus. And people took that bus and they couldn't get enough buses on that route because all the jobs were out there and the persons who were needing work were in the, in the downtown or the inner city. And that's the kind of smart strategy that communities need to have and it seems to me, I don't know much about the relations with, between CSU and Fort Collins or the other um, educational institutions here, but it seems to me that uh, in, a, in a university town, the relationship between the university and the locality is so important in getting those smart strategies and other public-private partnerships like the one I saw yesterday in Denver uh, around the transportation hub and Union Station. Um, and the way that that has come together in that community development area is pretty interesting and pretty important. And then finally, um, public policy questions. And Robert Reich and Joseph Stiglitz and others have laid out an agenda to try to address inequality 
at the public policy level. But it's hard to not talk about these first questions of tax rates and the tax system if we're going to talk about this issue. But uh, Stiglitz suggests that there's this unhealthy relation between political inequality and economic inequality. And the more political power that persons at the top have, the less likely you are to, to raise the capital gains rate or the top marginal income tax rate or at the local level our property tax rates. But those are things we, we need to talk about. And if it's true that um, that there's a distance, that there's a, a, a relationship between high economic inequality and low growth, maybe the, the slight disincentive effects that may exist when you raise tax rates are worth it in order to, to reduce inequality and to create the things we've been talking about, like social solidarity. And then these other aspects of jobs, training, public transport, affordable housing, educational access, and everyone, that everything I've read still shows that the premium, premium on education is incredibly high, and that those who are going to succeed in the global economy are those who will have a good, solid high school education, associate's degree, or bachelor's degree. And there's a lot of rhetoric about STEM fields. I still want to talk about liberal arts too. That those graduates are still getting a good premium on their on their education. But some of these are really addressing poverty per se, and not the inequality. As I suggested earlier, things like transport, though, do affect us all and do affect the quality of life of the whole society, the whole distribution, if you will. And then, how do you how do we think about civic engagement? I think it's really interesting that in Colorado you we send the ballots out to everyone. I wonder what that does for the distribution of voting and the participation rates, but the participation rates across the economy. That's a pretty interesting thing to talk about. How do we increase participation in the political system when we know that also has a social and economic gradient? So that's what I had to share. I come back to that question. How do we think about economic inequality within the framework of a moral commitment to equality? What, how much economic inequality is tolerable before we lose the sense that we're true equals in society? So the economists will talk about this, well, that's the democracy challenge, or that's social fragmentation. I hope that some of these questions and frameworks help us to think more fully about what we mean when we say we're all equals, equals before God, and equals as American citizens and so forth. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doug. That was really stimulating. Um, I think he's thrown out a lot of material for us, and um, I know he um, and, uh, and all of us would very much like to hear what, what you have to say, comments, um, questions, thoughts, in reaction to the ideas that have been raised here. And so I think the way we're going to do this is we're, we're going to um, uh, do this kind of Phil Donahue style. We'll pass the microphone around. Um, I'll work on this side. And Helen will pass on that side, and we'll try and uh, make sure everybody who has something to say will uh, we'll get a chance. Um, so let us open it up to you all um, in terms of your thoughts. Let's see, right back here. Having the microphone is power. <laughs> I, I won't keep it very long. <laughs> uh, there seems to be a clear difference between uh, the objective facts relating to inequality and uh, among, among others that the United States has the highest level of inequality, uh, except for Chile, among the 31 OECD countries, um, and the perception of inequality. And I, I just want to read one statistic here. Barely half, 47% of Americans think the rich-poor gap is a very big problem. Among advanced countries, only Australians expressed a lower level of concern. But in Australia, the top fifth earned just 2.7 times the income of the bottom fifth. In the United States, it's about 16.7%. So a huge, huge difference. Could you address 
the differences in the perception of inequality as they differ from country to country. Obviously, in America, we have a very large uh, acceptability or willingness to accept uh, inequality based based on these uh, statistics. Right. That's a great and really important question. It, it answer two ways. One, I think that's changing. I think that we've seen in the last, I, mean, I think you can put a point on the last three years, um, uh, a focus on inequality that I, you know, I've written about this for 20 years now. I feel like Robert Reich, you know, in his video, the documentary is like, I told you so, and here's a video of me telling you so 1987 <laughs> with more hair than 95. But um, I think that the public perception of inequality has shifted, and the Occupy mo movement may have been uh, both precipitated by and then a continuance of that, that change in sentiment. And so that's an important uh, point. I, you know, two-thirds of Americans said they supported one way or another the Occupy movement or the issues they were raising. And so that's shifting. But the, the question of why the level is so high, uh, the tolerance for inequality is high, I think it goes to the rhetoric of, and I don't mean to say it's not true or there's not something there, but the myth of the American dream and the myth of American mobility and the equality of opportunity. And it's a powerful, powerful thing. And, you know, every nation tells a different story about itself. I've taken students also to Denmark, and we heard from everyone, it's a rhetoric of equality. I mean, it's a, um, one person said, we're not very Christian in practice, but Christendom infuses all of our social values. And I think it's a little more complicated than that, but I believe it. It's a, you can really feel that sense of commitment to equality and embarrassment for showiness and so forth. Um, the United States has less mobility than we've had in former eras. We have less mobility than most of our peers in the OECD in terms of the ability, you know, the percent of people who leave the bottom quintile in a generation and so forth. And yet people continue to vote against their self-interest in the hopes of becoming part of that top 20% or becoming part of the 1% or whatever it is. I don't know how to do it except I feel the rhetoric changing and I think it should change. We need to, the facts and figures are one piece, the other is tell people telling their personal stories. I'm not calling anybody, I'm just looking at people. <laughs> There's a hand back, Jared. Hello, I've got the microphone. It's, right. it's a quick question, or maybe it's a statement. I'm not quite sure. Um, I work with um, mostly Medicaid eligible and lower income folk. And I was at the house of a mom who delivered nine days ago and is going back to work full time tomorrow because she has no other choice. Um, she and her mom, who she's living with, both work full time and between the two of them can afford a motel room. And they were absolutely gleeful at the possibility that uh, the Department of Human Services could provide a deposit and neighbor to neighbor might be able to provide a first month's rent. And they had a chance of moving into an apartment if they could find one. So they're in, they understand the inequality, and they understand how the deck is stacked against them from moving very far out of it. And um, to their credit, they continue to work and to struggle. And um, I'm feeling just a bit guilty. Thank you for sharing that. And in a way, I'm also want to say I'm so aware of some of the frameworks I'm, that I'm sharing or the even the economic graphs is so abstract and the stories that were the people and their lives that we're talking about are so important. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of economists have advocated uh, changing the marginal tax rates. Paul Krugman. Thomas Piketty and, uh, and others. But we've come to a point now where corporations are so large that they can manipulate entire countries. We have countries that are tax havens, like Ireland for drugs and uh, drug companies now, and uh, uh, 
the Caribbean for banks and all kinds of, of uh, situations where corporations have gotten so big they're even pushing the United States government around. So, so how do we, we get to an international uh, cooperation in order to encourage inequality internationally uh, in, the, in the face of this opposition? This one of the most important questions. I think it has to, it's got to go through political will. We've got to, again, get people willing to, to talk to our U.S. government about that. And, you know, Joseph Stiglitz, I add him to the list. He's deeply influenced by Piketty in that great book that somebody said today that the um, most sold, least read book of, our, of the year, um, Capital. Um, we have to, but there's, you know, one policy is to get national governments to hold corporations accountable for profits they make, but wherever they're made around the world. Um, how to do that and how technically to put that into, to, to pass that kind of legislation would be um, a real challenge. And you've got to have, you know, it's a race to the bottom. Same thing with states. If you keep dropping the tax rates, that's where people go, and then they have an incentive to do it. And we've got to turn around. I don't have any easy answers to how to do it. <coughs> Crossing over. I'm a little bit hesitant. At 85, I've learned that uh, I don't have much more time to share some perspectives. One perspective that I think is so <coughs> crucial is the way we frame the things we're talking about, the constructs that we use. For example, it seems to me that in attempting to solve a lot of these problems, there's a lot of a lot of focus and emphasis on the rights and rights and rights. And this time of my life at 85, I believe that there is a responsibility issue that has to be addressed. But another complex aspect of this is that in an attempt to help people many times, we enable them to persist in maladaptive ways and an inability to solve complex recurring problems. So I think we're going to have to have a better blend of rights and responsibility. And then on, communi on communication, to really communicate well requires much more effort than many people realize to achieve a common understanding of the nature of the problem as well as the solutions. And we just are not decimate enough from our culture to be able to sit down and hammer out and yet there are some people who have looked at this and have good information on solving complex and recurring problems, procedures. Uh, so I probably talk too much, but compassion and wisdom. When these recurring problems are solved, there's an element of compassion and there's an element of wisdom and knowledge and understanding particularly addressing a concern about enabling. Attempting to help people in the process, you enable them to continue those maladaptive ways of responding. Thanks. So the discussion of rights and responsibilities uh, is critical. And one of the reasons I like the capabilities language so much is that uh, in, in Sen's own language, it helps to equip people to be not patients, but agents. So human agency is, is an important word here. And, cap and what we need, though, is a social system that equips people, prepares them to have the capabilities. And so being well-educated, um, being in good health, being literate, both culturally and in terms of um, reading, as well as numeracy, all of these things will help people to become agents. So um, there's... You know, Sen, who, Sen would say, I would agree that rights language can be vacuous, and people can run around and say, I have a right not to be hungry, or I have a right. But it doesn't, one, that doesn't get food to that person. It also doesn't talk about um, 
their capacity or others' capacity to solve it. So capabilities, and I don't think this is just a turn of a quick turn of language, but it allows us to talk about both um, pers what persons deserve and the responsibilities for people to become agents for their own well-being. So it is hard to talk about the, you know, the, some of these are pretty loaded <coughs> questions when persons like people who you describe trying to make ends meet, what would it mean to say they need to take responsibility because it's already there in a very, they, they can't be agents because they're just, the, the situation, you know, they're, they're hoping to find affordable housing um, and make ends meet. So in some ways you got to go back to, to prepare people and equip them. Um, so I don't think right, and you know, to take the Catholic tradition, uh, and John the 23rd put rights and responsibilities together, and that was his critique of the Western right, the individualism of the rights tradition was that it didn't have the responsibilities. So for every claim of rights, there has to be an equal um, uh, duty, corresponding duty. Yeah. Sometimes the duty, I don't know if we'd agree, sometimes the duty is on the part of society and not just the individual, that we've got to have a situation where people are working together. I know three congregations in this city who spend 40% of their income for the needs of others. That makes me know that it can be done, but those are very small compared to what the problem is. And politically, it's difficult to get at the bigger problem. In small congregations, it's easy, I think, to talk about it and pray about it and do it. But how do I do it in the city? What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> well, for me, I gave the three levels, the personal, the communal, which would include I think, churches being engaged, and then the public policy, the governmental level. I remember a, a passage by the economist Rebecca Blank, who was uh, at one point Deputy uh, uh, Secretary of Commerce. She may have been acting Secretary of Commerce, but she wrote a book called It Takes a Nation. And it was during the welfare debates in the 90s when um, People are saying churches just need to step up. They need to step up and provide welfare, social safety support for the poor, and government shouldn't do it. And she has a calculation, I haven't looked at it for a couple of years, so I may get it wrong. But she took the annual budgets of every religious congregation Christian, Jewish, Muslim, Hindu, you name it, Buddhist added them all together, and the entire budgets of all the religious congregations in the country paled in comparison and scope to AFDC, or TANF now. And so the point was, communities of, and she's, she's a devout a, a person in the United Church of Christ and has written an important book called Do Justice, where she's an economist trying to do theology. Um, uh, but she was saying, of course, uh, people of faith, communities of faith need to do everything they can, partly to change hearts and to get people committed, and just to do their duty. But that don't think that uh, churches or other nonprofits acting together are going to replace uh, government structure for these important social services. Right. And so they've all got to go together. Um, and a 40% of budget, that's an incredible commitment um, of those congregations. And I'm sure at times it's frustrating because it probably feels like it's a drop in the bucket in terms of the problems that we're facing. I was particularly struck in your book about the uh, capabilities approach. And we talked a little bit about the Human Development Index. I was just wondering if you could reinforce that a little bit. And uh, in terms of changing the narrative that we might think the Human Development Index is more important than the GPD, although they're probably not incompatible, but... <clears throat> and would using self-interest be a moral way to try and change that narrative? I mean, in a sense, in terms of evolution, 
that the top 1%, do they not know that they can't live without the other 98%? <laughs> I'm going to check your math, but uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, the Human Development Index is, is an index developed by the United Nations Development Program. It was influenced by Sen's work on the capability approach, but I, you know, I had a list of I think seven capabilities. The HDI, the Human Development Index, looks at income, health, and education, which says let's broaden it from uh, income, not all the way to things like friendship and worshiping, but Education and health are vital, along with income. And so the Human Development Index ranks countries by the, the combination. It's right now it's an equally weighted index of those three spheres. So life expectancy and then a combination of some, health, um, some education. I think it's uh, graduation rates and enrollment rates. And then income adjusted for purchasing power. <coughs> and what it's already doing is it's, it's a public rhetoric. Some people say, well, you can't put an index together with education and health and income. When you do that, you already, um, you know, you're losing the meaning. Those three scalars are more important than the vector of the three. But the economists at the UNDP are saying, we're not just doing an index. We're, we're trying to change the conversation. And so my own work said, let's not look just at those three spheres, but let's look at inequality in the three. So I proposed... Very few people ever picked it up, but I proposed an IAHDI, which was an Inequality Adjusted Human Development Index. It looked at inequality of income, inequality of health, and inequality of education. It said, let's not look at three factors, but six. Those factors and then the inequalities of those. And all, you can do all kinds of interesting things, but again, trying to change the conversation. Um, and it's just as abstract as some of these other things. If you say, well, that's just another measurement, another set of graphs and tables. But the UNDP has used these indices to prioritize development projects, prioritize funding proposals, and so forth. So it's had some success there. And the other important thing, and I'm not a U.S. basher. I'm uh, proud, you know, to be an American. Uh, and I'm, you know, I think there's so many great things about the economy and the uh, consumer products that are available, all that stuff. But there's no way around it. We're inefficient. We're among, one of the, we're among the most inefficient countries in the world in converting high incomes into educational outcomes and into health outcomes, including life expectancy. And if we believe that it's those capabilities that matter more, like being literate, being healthy, being alive, those are more important than how much money we have in our bank accounts. But see, that bank accounts as a means to those ends. We're not doing as well as we could. We're not living up to... We're not efficient in converting income into those things that matter. And that's a, I think that's a helpful way of thinking about it, and it puts some fire in our feet. You know, the media seems to stress when we talk about inequality, you know, it's primarily the income piece, you know, and what have you. And I like that you brought up the capabilities, so in, in that vein, and the changing the conversation, what role do you think the media can play to help us change that uh, conversation and change the paradigm? David? <laughs> it's a good question. The UNPs, UNDPs thought about it. They do much fancier press conferences when they release the Human Development Index every year. You know, Marty Sen used his Nobel Prize to try to, to change the rhetoric on economic development. Um, it's hard. I, I talk to journalists sometimes about the moral aspects of inequality, and they want to quickly get to the policy questions. They want to quickly get to the, the simplest thing to measure. And the poverty rate is a very clean, very simple measure in this country. And every year, a story comes out and says the poverty rate went up 0.6 or went down 0.6. And it matters because of the effects it has on actual human beings. But we are very high on the poverty gap from getting what the amount of money it would take to get everyone up to the poverty threshold. And you can look at different factors. But somehow we need um, we need stories that pe that that you know someone called sticky ideas. We need things that are just as simple as the poverty threshold, the Orshansky index, you know, the, our basic U.S. method so that people have something else to talk about. And the Human Development Index has that, that stickiness to it. 
There was another effort by a, a theologian named John Cobb for the Genuine Progress Indicator. I don't know if you heard of that. You probably did for this reason. It had like 11 variables in it. And it, um, it, you know, it confused even the authors and the readers of this book. So you need stuff that, and this is not my area, but it's, it is a campaign. It's a media campaign. It's an outreach. It's a public campaign to get people to care. And that's why people like Warren Buffett, and in a different way, Bill Gates, and others who are willing to talk about issues like this are so vital. And obviously, Pope Francis, both with his actions, which become symbolic immediately, and his writings. Um, yeah. I have a niece who is a Susan Helper, who is a chief presently the chief economist for the U.S. Department of Commerce. She's on loan from Case Western, where she's a professor of economics. She is a graduate of, of uh, Oberlin, and the Oberlin magazine asked her a question about inequality and asked her whether it's important or not. She says, the top 1% of income has a net, people with the top 1% income have a net worth 288 times as high as the typical family, which is a record for this country. A child born in the top 20% has two in three chances of staying near the top, and a child born in the bottom 20% has less than a one in 20 shot of making it to the top 20%. 10, 10 times more likely to stay where they are. And she goes ahead and say, the, the um, people ask whether it is, it's odds to uh, spread out the wealth. So meanwhile, concentrating the wealth at the top, it, it, it ranks the greatest, meanwhile, saving at the top wealth, result in less consumer spending, which drives our economy. So we need to dispel the myth that the both goals of growing the economy and reducing inequality are arms with each other. In fact, historically, our economy grows best from the middle out when growth is more widely shared. And one other observation. I was a professor at the University of Illinois for a long time, and we had a sister college in India, in Uttar Pradesh. The students came over, and you the situation that we had trouble with, students came over, earned their master's or PhD, and they didn't want to go back because the chance of making a living like we make in the U.S. and in India was so un unlikely that rather than going back there, they'd rather stay in the U.S. Some married U.S. citizens so they could stay. I mean, maybe they didn't want to marry them. Maybe they had a, had a slight... Uh, prejudice to do that. Others went back and then came back to the U.S. Uh, as a literature. So anyway, I can see why we like living in the U.S. and why we should be doing something to equal off the uh, economic situation. Thanks, your niece hit the nail on the head very concisely. There, there's a growing consensus. Uh, I'm glad to know she's in commerce and has this perspective on inequality and its negative effects on things like economic productivity. And the brain, the brain drain phenomenon you describe is also a, a fundamental part of globalization. And you know, one way of putting it is the best way to deal with immigration challenges is to help Mexico, to help India develop. And you know, you make a self-interest argument about that from the US to do that. And um, I'm glad you all are talking about immigration with Father Mike Baxter and others, right, um, later this year, because it's a vital part of this debate. If you had uh, one, one, one argument for global citizenship from an economic perspective would be to open up all the gates between countries and allow free movement of labor. But free movement of labor is free movement of people. And it's a political challenge of membership and so forth. So I didn't I didn't recommend that as a policy change. But I said it is one way to be consistent and to address this. The other way is to have more even economic development so that people have less incentives to go one way, or put differently, there's incentives for people to move both directions.
Well, one of the concerns that I have is that to bring this down to the local level, but it also goes to the national, and that is a spirit of elitism that my concern about for a Collins is growing to be more elitist, which then means that the people at the lower end have a harder and harder time making it in a city, and then there's the standard of everything being so nice and so good, and so that gets it down to what am I willing to give up so that somebody else can have a place to live. And that works at the national level, too. I think the United States has a sense of elitism in the world. So how do we work that into our theology? I'm, I'm going to take that as a comment. It's a really good one. It connects to what your neighbor named as the challenge. And you, I think you have a, I was told today you have a 3.2% unemployment rate in Fort Collins. Yeah. Which is really great, but it means it's probably pushing others out, and then the the, the, um, the occupancy rate is under one percent, or it's, it's over ninety nine percent, which means the price of housing is. I don't need to tell you this. Either. <laughs> um, it's great for landlords, and it's great for economy in a certain way, unless you can't afford to live here. <laughs> and I told David, I'll. I'm happy to have a conversation as long as you want, so one of you is going to have to stay when, it's, when, when you don't want to talk anymore. Yeah. Yes, I'd like to follow up with another spiritual question, spiritual found, grounded question. You know, Gordon Gecko in the famous movie, Greed is Good, uh, Profits are More Important Than Anything Else. Do you know of anybody who's writing uh, about greed and doing any any credible theological reflection on greed, because that seems to me to be an element that's a, f a major factor of what's going on in this country relative to income inequality and uh, economics. It's um, a great question. I I'd like to get back to you on that. I mean, I know some friends who've written on, say, desire or envy. And you know, desire as both a positive part of the economy in our lives, as well as a, a you know a, something that can lead towards greed. Why are, why are we talking about this? Yeah. Greed, it seems so apparent, but nobody seems to want to talk about it. I know there are a lot of ethicists who want to talk about greed, but they do it as part of a kind of critique of the economy as a whole. And what I think we need to do is separate out the. Uh, the healthy sense of self-interest from greed, as Adam Smith did. So you want, my first answer was going to be Adam Smith, but he wouldn't have called, he called himself a moral, moral philosopher, not a theologian, and he's also deceased. Um, but, uh, but, you know, I think there's a lot to reading moral sentiments and um, wealth of nations together to get at some of this. And then there are, you know, a lot of economists and ethicists writing about what the goal of business should be, and that there's a double bottom line, meaning uh, profit and doing good in the community, or a triple bottom line, including environmental stewardship. Um, and, and thus, uh, profit making isn't the only or, or exclusive measure of the health of a, of, an, uh, of a company. And so, employee, and then there's a lot written on employee well being as different from profits and the need to look at shareholder benefits and not just stockholder benefits. Uh, you know, uh, positives that come out of the situation. Why don't we do one more question? Ellen, is there somebody on your side that you have any questions on that side? We don't want to be unequal here. Yeah. <laughs> okay. How about over here? Do you have your hand up, sir? Make it a good one. That's a, that's a challenge. You, you have made uh, the connection between economic and political power. Uh, we happen to be in an election season <coughs> really? when, when, that seems, when that seems to be ever more apparent. Uh, one wonders how we get off the train. Increasingly, there is this uh, 
the power of economics in, in the political sphere. And it's, it's, I think, worrisome for all of us. But how do we change that? The Citizens United decision and the opening up of uh, more money into the political system is a, was a watershed moment. In fact, you might say the backlash has been some of the Occupy movement and the, the anti-inequality rhetoric. I don't have some easy formula, but I do. I do sense that there that people are willing to talk about this in public now and to to turn the tide. What I haven't seen in the nasty commercials I see in upstate New York is any political commercials or any um, campaigning around this particular issue, which is trouble. It means it's not there yet. There's no. There aren't any people making promises to address this question, at least in the rhetoric of what I've seen up in upstate New York. But that's what's got to happen, is it's got to become part of the, the rhetoric. And, and someone in this area on campaign finance reform is going to have to write a bill that people, that will have the, the prudence to get through the Congress, and then we'll need the political will to sign it. But it's going to be, then they're going to have a debate with the Supreme Court and Congress about what is, uh, you know, a viable law and what isn't. But I think that's got to be a part of the discussion: is uh, campaign finance and drawing better walls between the econ between economic wealth and political power. And it'll never be a tight wall. There'll always be financial influence. That's not. I mean, we have to be realists. I think you can't just keep them completely separate. But you, that doesn't mean that anything goes, and that any amount of money can influence the political process. And how to get that done, I think, is one of the real challenges. I want to let um, Martha Conant have the last word because she has an opportunity uh, to tell us all about, and then we'll, um, we'll thank Doug and wrap up. Thanks, Drew. What a rich conversation this has been. And I'm sure most of you want to continue it. So um, we have an opportunity to form small groups, and I was thinking that it might be nice to um, form those groups around Dr. Hicks's book, Money Enough. Um, I will be out here at the table in the hall, so if you're interested, I have sign-up sheets and um, would love to have many of you participating. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Martha, for organizing that opportunity for us. And I want to thank you all once again um, for being here tonight, for your <coughs> fabulous and stimulating questions. And please join me in closing with a, uh, a warm thank you for Dr. Douglas.